This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. When 22-year-old college student Linda Yalem doesn't return from an afternoon run, her roommates are worried. For years, a violent rapist has been roaming the area. The women in the town of Amherst, they were absolutely terrified. The next afternoon, police discover her body. She had duct taped over her face, uh, over her mouth and nose. There were signs of a, uh, an intense struggle. Linda's death triggers a massive manhunt, but it will take seasoned detectives 16 years of relentless investigation to track down their elusive killer. Linda Yalem's body is discovered at 5.20 the next afternoon, just 40 yards from the bike path. Where the detectives found her body, uh, she was in a, in a, like a wooded type area. Investigators combed the scene for clues. She was killed by asphyxiation. Uh, duct tape was found over her mouth and nose. The killer not only bounded her to um, get away, he bounded her to kill her. She had ligature marks on her neck, double ligature marks. We didn't know what kind of, could have been rope or wire or anything. The survivors of previous rapes in the area were all left with ligature marks on their necks, caused by some kind of thin cord or garrot. We had rapes and a murder. And the similarities were that whoever was doing this was using a garrot and that he would tighten it and he brought these women in and out of consciousness, the two survivors anyway. With the double ligature marks, there was a quick connection made to the bike path rapist who had been terrorizing Western New York for years previous to this. All of the victims had this on their necks. It was his signature. This is how he controlled his victim. But with Linda Yalem, he killed her. Whoever this was, was escalating. The shocking news of the rape and murder makes national headlines. Linda's friends back home in California can't believe it. My father called and made sure that my roommates were around. He didn't want to give me the news when I was by myself, and um, he's the one who told me. I was devastated. I mean, it was very hard to believe. When you hear something like that, you just can't help not. But, you know, just totally lose it. I mean, why? It's, it's senseless. Linda had been at the University of Buffalo for just three weeks. She was pursuing a career in public relations. Linda was very sweet and outgoing and caring, and that's why everyone loved her. Just the reaction was just total shock from everybody. That how could something this bad happen to someone this nice? You can't take anything for granted because um, she was there one day, perfectly happy, healthy, going places, bright, bright future, and then um, next day she's gone. Searching for clues, homicide detectives review the case files of the earlier rapes. There were a number of attacks. It was long suspected that, that uh, many of the crimes were committed by the same individual. And they started putting together a pattern of rapes where women were attacked on recreational paths. Police believe the bike path rapist had assaulted at least six women, ranging from a 14-year-old student to a 32-year-old businesswoman. But until now, he'd never killed. Now you know you have a serial rapist in the community who now just murdered a college girl. Detectives re-interview the surviving rape victims. One woman recounts the horrifying morning she came face to face with the killer. I was going to school on time, um, and the friend who was supposed to walk with me, he was running late. So I just went by myself. I wasn't even on, like, walking past the railroad tracks for two minutes, three minutes tops before he came behind me and grabbed me. I felt something come around my face, grabbing me and pulling me. It felt like a wire. The victims were attacked pretty much the same way. There was a grot used, which is kind of a rope or a wire type device that was used to gain their compliance. 
it's completely terrifying because you have absolutely no power or control of what's happening. You can't breathe, so you can't think clearly of what to do. He would carefully plan locations, not victims. There really was never a victim type, but there were distinct locations. And you just wait. Whoever it happened by next was a person he selected. Once he got me to the place where he wanted me, he instantly tied my hands up behind my back, so I was laying on my hands, so I couldn't move, I couldn't go anywhere. Composite sketches based on the victim's descriptions are strikingly similar. I saw he had olive skin, like Puerto Rican or Spanish. Some of them had him as Italian or Hispanic with a possible Spanish accent. They had him with dark hair. But there's one thing all the victims said. He had piercing eyes. He had these eyes they would never forget. Deep, dark eyes that they would never forget. Every single person, they said there's something about his eyes. And it was consistent among all the victims. They kept saying there's something about his eyes and I really can't describe it. I figured the best thing was just to do what he asks. And he said that if I did, he would leave. I think if I were older and I fought harder, it would have made him more aggressive. And making him more aggressive would have made things a whole lot worse for me. Although DNA testing was relatively new in 1990, Dr. John Simich from the County Crime Lab uses samples taken from the victims to confirm investigators' suspicions. I forwarded the samples to the FBI for uh, RFLP testing. RFLP is Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism. It was the first generation of uh, forensic DNA testing that was developed. They were able to determine that we had several rapes and one rape homicide in the area that were done by the same individual. Police now have a pattern and a profile. The bike path killer waits in ambush, targeting women and girls walking alone. The attacker is of Hispanic or Italian heritage. And a garrot is used to subdue the victims, leaving a trademark double ligature mark around their necks. We came to see that uh, the same person was not only doing the rapes, but had now graduated to homicide. Buffalo's bike path rapist is now a confirmed killer. As detectives step up their manhunt, a panicked public wonders who could be next? The murder of 22-year-old Linda Yalom shocks Buffalo and the surrounding suburbs. With a killer on the loose, police and the media urge women to take extra caution when jogging or biking. The warnings were more, don't go on the path by yourself, take somebody with you, um, you know, have a dog with you. The attacks were more in the morning, so be careful if, if you're there during the dawn hours. Everybody in this county knew about the bike path rapist. Um, you know, the sketches, um, the composite sketches of him were everywhere. Within the community, there's both fear and outrage that the rapist turned killer is still at large. Investigators turn to the rape survivors for help. Some of the other women were distraught, and it was hard for them to talk about it or help out. Well, for me, he got one day. From the moment it happened, that was my decision. Is you ruined one day for me? and I wasn't gonna let you ruin anything else. And if it took me doing whatever I could to help the police find you, I was gonna do it. With a concerned community demanding an arrest, authorities also appeal to local residents for help. Amherst Police Department did several news conferences where they've asked the public to come forward. We eliminated people through their work records. Maybe they were out of town. And we talked to all different kinds of, of men, men from all different walks of life, professional people, working people. Desperate for a break in the case, police send a female officer out as a decoy. 
what we did with her is we put a neck brace on her, had her go out and, and, and run, and we uh, would set up uh, officers in different locations so if she got in trouble she could uh, call out to us. Surveillance teams pose as campers in the woods along the bike path. We actually put uh, officers out in the woods in camouflage laying there in the, in the woods starting like at five o'clock in the morning just in the event somebody would show up. If he saw something suspicious he would call for a uniform patrol to stop and check the guy and get his identification. Men matching the suspect's profile are asked to submit a blood sample for DNA testing. In 1990, DNA technology was just getting going. Amherst, eager to catch the killer, was sending blood samples from everyone that they possibly could think that could be the bike path killer. And they were sending dozens and dozens. And at one point, the FBI told them, look, you got to stop. You're sending way too many. You really need to narrow this down. I know at one point we were up to like 40 people that we took DNA on. And it just got to a point where we just kept digging. And we just never hit on the right one. For weeks, then months, the investigation continues without an arrest. For authorities, there's a growing and frightening realization. The killer is as careful and clever as he is dangerous. If he's on a jogging path, he was wearing a windbreaker and a baseball cap. So was everybody else. He fit in. He was the guy that blended in. He never raised any suspicions. But with a history of six rapes and one murder, detectives believe the killer can't help himself, that it's almost certain he'll strike again. He had always been a rapist, and now all of a sudden, he was a murderer as well. There's no accident involved here. You look back at these cases, he was going toward being a murderer. But for two years, the killer lays low. Then, Buffalo police receive a disturbing 911 call. There was a guy, I believe he was walking his dog, and uh, he came across a pile of debris. And when he started uh, checking it out, uh, he discovered it was a body underneath. There was a kitchen garbage bag uh, tied around her neck over her head, a sheet of plywood on top of her, some rocks uh, thrown on top of that, just to make it look like a pile of uh, debris. Officers identify the woman as May Jane Mazur. The 32-year-old had been reported missing by her husband several weeks earlier. The uh, autopsy uh, said it was a combination of strangulation with a ligature and uh, suffocation. She had a double ligature on her neck uh, mark, which was consistent with our other cases we investigated. Authorities contact May Jane's estranged husband regarding his wife's death. Their daughter, Christine, then five years old, remembers her dad's reaction. I came downstairs and my dad was sitting on the edge of the bed uh, crying and I asked him what was wrong and he said that uh, my mom wasn't coming back anymore. I just remember kind of like a video playing in my head over and over again of her being loaded in the ambulance. And my dad taped that newscast and watched it a lot. I don't remember anything else after that. It was like just a gap. Although May Jane's neck bears the double ligature mark, there is little else to connect her murder to the bike path killer. She wasn't found in a bike path. Uh, she was found in a, in a field, and it didn't match that way in uh, any of the evidence in the other bike path type cases. It was a different kind of victim. They didn't even think that this could be possibly connected to the bike path rapist case. But there's something that does match. The Erie County lab did DNA tests on cold case, and they discovered that May Jane Mazur was a victim of the bike path rapist. Investigators are stunned. They realized, oh my God, even Linda Yalem wasn't the only murder victim. The Buffalo area's serial rapist turned murderer is now a serial killer. He was gearing up. The violence was escalating. The community is gripped with fear terrified that a compulsive killer will strike again. They have to do it 
again and again and again. Uh, that's how they operate. Just an evil person. He wasn't going to stop. I think he thrived on it, and, and, and he needed it. But over the next two years, the attacks abruptly cease. Oh, I'm thinking they're never going to catch this guy. Then, once again, the killer's demons escape. A 14-year-old girl is attacked on her way to high school. He got something around her neck. It was a, a garrot. He tightened it, got her compliance. He walked her to a predestined area. The terrified victim is asked to describe everything she can about her attacker. The descriptions were the same of the offender. Same general height, same general build, same either Hispanic or Italian descent. Results from the rape kit confirm the bike path rapist has struck again. They also reveal some shocking new information. The assailant appeared to be aspermic. You know, in other words, we had seminal fluid, but there were no sperm present, or very few. In the early 90s, the bike path rapist either had two things happen to him. One was a vasectomy, or two, he was subject to chemotherapy. The police continue to pursue every lead while living in dread of another assault. But once again, years pass without any new attacks. In the mind of law enforcement, is we were just waiting. When is he going to come back and strike? And then we ultimately felt that he would come back. This time, 10 years go by. Fears in the community start to ease. Joggers gradually return to the bike paths. At some point, I think, after those attacks, things kind of return to normal. He's not the topic of conversation anymore. A lot of people thought that uh, he had gotten ill and, and died. Um, some people thought he had been arrested and, and was imprisoned. People thought he had moved, relocated, and he was doing the same thing, but just in a different geographical area. Nobody really knew. Twelve years after the last attack, the terror created by the bike path killer is all but forgotten. Then, on the 16th anniversary of Linda Yellum's murder, the sheriff's office receives a frantic phone call. A female jogger is missing along the bike path. I was advised that Joan Diver had gone jogging and she was missing and there was no evidence of anything at that point in time foul play, but they didn't know where she was. Uh, and that uh, to get to the scene as soon as I could. Investigators wonder if this could be a copycat crime or just a frightening coincidence. In fact, it's neither. After a 12-year absence, the bike path killer is back. Get more solved online. On the 16th anniversary of Linda Yalem's murder, police raced to a suburban Buffalo bike path where 45-year-old jogger Joan Diver was last seen. Joan Diver, she just dropped her children off at daycare. She was going to do what her ritual was, head out to the Clarence bike path, get a five-mile run in, come back and pick her child up from daycare shortly after 11 a.m. When she failed to pick her children up at daycare, the daycare center contacted her husband, who's a professor at the University of Buffalo. And her husband called 911 to report it, his wife uh, missing. Mr. Diver called and indicated that he was concerned that uh, something had to happen to his wife because there would be no way that she wouldn't have picked up the child at the school. And he left work at the University of Buffalo to drive to pick up the kids. On his way home, Stephen Diver notices his wife's SUV in the bike path parking lot. He calls 911, but when police arrive minutes later, the SUV is gone. Someone move her car. That was the question we had before us now. Then, less than an hour later, patrol officers locate the vehicle. 
Joan Diver's SUV was found right near a hardware store a couple miles away. The vehicle is locked and the keys are missing. There is no sign of Joan or her belongings. The Erie County Sheriff's Office immediately launches a search. They start in the parking lot next to the bike path where Joan's car was first spotted. We're talking about an area along the bike path that's probably six or seven miles long, stretching out, you know, a, a couple hundred yards from the path itself. It was an enormous area. Authorities contact Joan's family for any information on her whereabouts. My mother called me on a Friday and said that the police said that Joan Lee was missing. We don't know what's happened to her, but we know something's happened because she didn't pick up her little boy at preschool. I was just so surprised. I mean, I just thought, well, sir, certainly there's a, you know, a logical explanation for her not being there. My older sister called me and asked if I'd heard anything about uh, Joan. And I said, no, what do you mean? And she says, well, she's missing. And, you know, have you heard anything? Or she called or anything like that? And I said, no, uh, I haven't heard. And, um, and uh, you know, I didn't know what to think about that exactly. The next afternoon, the sheriff's office decides to scale back the search and move on to other leads. But Joan's husband is certain his wife is still out there. With the help of friends and neighbors, he continues the hunt. Two days later, his fears are confirmed. A volunteer discovers Joan's body. 15, 20 yards off the bike path in this real thick brush. And she was uh, found basically laying, uh, laying in that brush. One of the things that jumped out immediately was that double ligature mark around her neck. It's now the familiar signature of a deadly predator. It was like all the other crime scenes. It was off a bike path. Joan Diver was left in a clearing near a wooded area. She had double ligature. It appeared that there had been a struggle, but there was no DNA found on her body, and the medical examiner, uh, his, his finding was that there had not been a sexual assault. Detectives quickly focus on Jones' SUV. Whoever moved it may have left clues. We were pretty sure that someone involved in the crime had moved the vehicle. So in a process like that, you're going to go over every inch of the vehicle, front to back, interior, exterior, and uh, basically like, leave no stone unturned. Deputy Maruso starts with the car's interior. You would think of the necessary places that someone have to touch the vehicle to move it. We thought that the steering wheel had been swapped down. We necessarily swapped the gear shift knob. We swapped the buttons on the radio. And then came to the point where we said we should swap this ignition. It was a, quite a large shroud. The key fits inside the shroud. And uh, we just swabbed the exterior of that. The swabs are sent to the lab for DNA testing. One of the items, the ignition switch, yielded a profile from an unknown male individual. I then took that profile, submitted it to our local DNA data bank, where I was able to search it, and it returned a matching profile. As soon as I saw the number, I'd recognize it as the profile I had entered years earlier from the bike path rapist case. Simich is stunned. He immediately calls the district attorney with the news. And he asked me, are you sitting down? And I said, you know, yes. And um, he said, it's the bike path rapist. I was speechless. After a 12 year absence, the bike path killer has returned and killed for the third time. Why haven't they caught this guy? He's actually killed again. This, this poor woman who's a mother of four children. It's a race against time, and investigators are still one fatal step behind. There is a lot of frustration and fear within the community because they know a lot about him. They have a pretty good idea of what he looks like. They've got his DNA, so they know it's, it's one man. But somehow they're not catching him. Now, more than a decade later, a new generation of investigators will match wits with one of the most elusive serial killers in American history.
In 2006, 45-year-old Joan Diver becomes the third victim of the Bike Path Killer's deadly odyssey. Can you even imagine, I mean, snuffing out someone's life and taking them away from their loving family and their little children for their own uh, few minutes of self-gratification or power? Her family remembers Joan as a loving mother and caring wife. She was such a good mother to her little children, four little children that she left behind. The youngest one was only four years old. I didn't know she had so many friends or knew so many people. The effect that Joan had on the community, uh, the community just came out and was really uh, kind and uh, sympathetic and uh, just came out of the woodwork. With the death toll rising and the community demanding justice, a multi-agency task force is created. For Lieutenant Negrelli, it's the chance he's been waiting for. I remember sitting in the office on many days thinking, I wish I had a crack to work on this case. My dad worked on it, my uncle worked on it. Countless other police officers went into retirement working on this case and not able to solve it. I didn't want another victim, but I wanted the opportunity to work on it. The task force announces a telephone tip line. Probably at least 1,500 leads or better came in. Some of them could be from family members, relatives, neighbors, it could be anything. Then we narrow down the prioritization as to who was in jail, who was not in jail, who was in town at the time of some of these attacks or all of these attacks. It became overwhelming, so I was doing as much as I could to help them before they'd go out and talk to somebody or whether they needed to get DNA. To narrow the list of tips, the task force turns to a new type of DNA analysis called biogeographical profiling. The test identifies DNA based on race, ethnic background, and the region of the world where the DNA is typically found. I examined the data, and the new information clearly was able to point now more closely to an individual of Hispanic type population of uh, individuals. So we just started to pull all the Hispanic surnames um, from their case files. Betsy started from the Z's, and I started from the A's, and we started to work our way toward the middle. In addition to the DNA testing, the task force also calls in the FBI. Specially trained behavioral analysts pour over the details of the killer's 15-year crime spree. Looking at that first rape, the methodology, how smooth and polished, and how easily he did this, they said, this is not his first attack. Look, the previous attacks. Maybe cold, maybe closed. But look, this is not his first attack. When officers go back and sift through old rape cases, they make a stunning discovery. I found an old spreadsheet, and it listed several attacks that happened in the Delaware Park in the early 1980s. There was approximately five other rapes, right in the same area that the 1981 rape occurred. And they continued till probably from 1981 to 1985, and they were all in the same area by a statue of David. We started to read the victim statements and the physical description, the location of the, the incidents, the words that he said to the victims, and other similarities struck us as, as, as being the same suspect that we were investigating. Detectives suddenly realize the bike path killer has committed even more rapes than they thought. And we're looking back and forth. I go, this guy didn't do 10. He's done at least 16. They didn't start in 1985, they started in 1981. And even more terrifying, another man was arrested and charged with his early crimes. Detective Delano was there, he goes, oh yeah, there was a guy that was arrested, he was a Delaware Park rapist, and that's when I said, yeah, that was Anthony Capozzi, I remember him. I said, well, where is he now, because he just didn't do these attacks. He said, uh, he's in jail. He's in jail for these crimes. I said, well, we gotta find him, because he didn't do those crimes then. In fact, Anthony Capozzi is in Attica Prison, where he's been for 21 years. There was absolutely no physical evidence linking him to the crimes. He was convicted basically on uh, two eyewitness testimonies. That's it. 
we went to Attica Prison. We sat down with uh, Anthony Capozzi and we started um, talking to him. And Anthony has um, some decreased uh, mental capacity. The investigators ask Anthony if he was involved in the Delaware Park rapes. He said, I would never do that. I have sisters at home. I would never rape a woman. He wanted to cut the interview short because it was spaghetti night that day at Attic and he didn't want to miss the spaghetti dinner. I remember when we, we walked out of the prison, all three of us looked at each other and we said, no way is this our guy. And so that actually started um, another lead in the investigation, starting to take another look at those attacks that uh, Anthony Capozzi was um, um, arrested for. Detectives immediately dig into the old Delaware Park rape files, hoping for new clues to the bike path killer's identity. They make two case breakthroughs. First, a critical statement from a rape survivor. In one of those files, Scott found a mention, a note, that the Buffalo Police Department had received a complaint from the rape victim in 1981 that a couple days following her rape, her family trying to cheer her up, took her to a local shopping mall. Outside the mall, the rape victim came face to face with her attacker. He was with his wife, pushing a small child in a stroller. Immediately, they both recognized each other. They left in a hurry, but a relative of hers followed him uh, to his car and got the license plate number. Police ran the plates. The vehicle belonged to a man named Wilfredo Carabello. Buffalo police, when they went to interview Wilfredo Carballo, he denied having his vehicle used, that nobody used it, it was in his garage. And they did a photo array, took a photo of Wilfredo, and went back to the victim, and the victim could not identify Wilfredo Carballo. But with Carabello's car now linked to the bike path killer, investigators need to speak with him again. While Detective Rosansky tracks down his current whereabouts, task force members dig up a second promising lead, this time in the Linda Yalem case file. Following the death of Linda Yalem, a local worker named Bob had called Amherst Police Department and said that he had a co-worker he thought resembled the sketch of the bike path rapist. And Bob's co-worker was a gentleman by the name of Altimio Sanchez. The two worked together on the graveyard shift at a local brass factory. Bob decided to go to the police because not only had he seen Al Sanchez the day before Lindy Alum's murder, but on the bike path. He'd seen him on the bike path where he acted like he didn't recognize him, although they're co-workers. Police then went out to the brass factory and discovered that Al Sanchez had been off during the, the, the two rapes and the murder. In 1990, police had questioned Sanchez about the murder of Linda Yalem. He was willing to come in to be interviewed, and they, they talked to him, but he didn't quite match the description that had been given by one of the victims. Uh, his hairline was different. He was willing to be fingerprinted, and they wanted his fingerprints because they wanted to see if it matched those found on a water bottle that was found near one of the uh, rape victims, and they didn't match. So ultimately, they let him go. But suddenly, these two old leads come together. Wilfredo Carabello, the owner of the car spotted at the mall, contacts detectives. I was in the car with Al when we received the phone call from him. We said, hello, yeah, we're with the Erie County Sheriff's Office. He said, I know why you're looking for me. It's about that thing that happened many years ago. I wasn't driving the vehicle. My nephew, Altimio Sanchez, was driving the vehicle. It's the moment detectives have been waiting for. They now have eyewitnesses that tie Sanchez to two of the crimes. After 20 years, the pieces of the puzzle are finally falling into place. Immediately, I made phone calls and got everybody back to the office that Wednesday, the whole task force at 3 o'clock for a meeting. At the meeting, the task force members review the new evidence. Sanchez was absent from work and seen on the bike path the day Linda Yellen was murdered. His uncle admits Sanchez was driving his car when it was spotted at the mall. And Sanchez 
fits the description of the killer. I could tell you every person in that room, all 12, instantly came up with the same thought. Holy cow, we gotta get surveillance on this guy. Detectives need to obtain DNA from Sanchez to prove their case, and there's no time to waste. Can you imagine if we have him as a suspect, and while we have him, he either flees, or God help us, he victimizes another woman. Convinced that Altimio Sanchez is the notorious bike path killer, detectives urgently need a sample of his DNA to make a positive identification. The investigators hatched a plan to follow uh, the defendant and get his what we call abandoned DNA. Investigators put a tail on Sanchez. When he and his wife enter a restaurant, they make their move. We grabbed the manager and we said we would like them to leave the table intact and not touch it after these individuals left. They were very cooperative at the restaurant. And ultimately, when they left, the evidence was gathered. I tested the samples. I, I swapped the straw initially, uh, the glass that he drank from, swapped the outside rim of the glass, and then I swapped the napkin. The DNA samples are sent to the lab. The next day, Investigators get the call they've been waiting for. Dr. Simmons called me on the cell phone, and I just said, hang on one second. I put him on speaker right away, put the phone down on the table. I said, go ahead, John, everybody's here. We're sitting around the table, and his exact words were, you got him. The long hunt for the bike path killer is finally over. I can't believe we got him. We got that and automatically you kick in the, back in the mode. We gotta figure out how we're gonna do this. How are we gonna take him down? But Sanchez gives up without a fight. He's pulled over by police as he leaves work. He simply pulled over to the side of the road and he stopped. And at that point, we surrounded him. Uh, he was removed from the vehicle. He was very compliant. The 48-year-old father of two is arrested and escorted to the sheriff's department for questioning. Once in custody, he stonewalls detectives. Every time we asked him a question, or we confronted him with a fact, he would say the same response. That's what you say. That's all he kept on saying, all he uttered, that's what you say. They showed him crime scene photos. That's what you say. We told him where we got his DNA from. That's what you say. While Sanchez is being interviewed, his wife is questioned at a separate location. She couldn't believe it. She didn't want to believe it. She did acknowledge that he had been spoken to about this case in the past. She knew and obviously didn't believe it and thought it was nothing. But the further we got into questioning her about his medical history, she acknowledged that he, in fact, did have a vasectomy. Everything that we had told her, evidence that we had had against him, things that she was confirming for us, things we already knew. After an intense eight-hour interrogation, Altimio Sanchez still refuses to give up any information. I walked in the room, I said, it's a wrap, we're done. And Altimio Sanchez stood up like he was gonna walk out of the room. And it kind of startled me for a second. Where do you think you're going? You're not going anywhere. You're not going home tonight. You're never going home. You're under arrest for murder. You're never going home. News of the arrest quickly reaches the victim's friends and families. Me and my grandma were in the store shopping. I, I got a phone call that they had arrested uh, Altemio Sanchez and they were charging him with my mom's murder and that he was in custody and we just started crying in the middle of the store. I'm sure we looked foolish, but we were just crying. My mom called me and said, hey, there's a break in the case. They caught Linda's killer. I'm like, no way. I was just shocked to find out that he was uh, just an ordinary guy like you'd find in your neighborhood. While authorities compile evidence to put Sanchez away for life, they also try to free an innocent man. Getting Capozzi was released was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my career. They all overlooked quite a bit to get a conviction on Anthony. And it was bordering on bizarre trying to get him out. 
The court requires physical evidence to exonerate Kaposi. Task force members find slides stored from the rape kits of Kaposi's alleged victims. That's when the search warrant was drafted and we got the slides. That's either definitively going to tell us if it's Kaposi or somebody else. Once those results uh, came back that it was not Kaposi and it was Sanchez, within a few days of, we confirmed our results, within a few days of that, it was our motion to dismiss against Anthony Kaposi. After spending 22 years in prison, Kaposi is released to the care of the Buffalo Psychiatric Center. Kaposi's relatives and members of the task force are there to greet him. The reaction of his family it was overwhelming. You don't often get to meet good people like that and be able to do something like that for someone. It may have been a once in a lifetime opportunity in my career. Although Sanchez admits to committing more than 10 rapes, he can't be charged. The statute of limitations on those crimes has expired. But faced with overwhelming evidence, he pleads guilty to all three murders. We knew we had him like a trap rat. DNA matched on all of the, the crime scenes we looked for. I just couldn't see him going to trial. In a hushed courtroom, Sanchez makes a public apology for his crimes. Whatever sentence I get today, I deserve. I know I'm going to be spending life behind bars, never to see the streets again. But I committed, I did these crimes, and I should pay for these crimes. And Mr. Diver, and the Allen family, I apologize. But I know I can never bring back your loved ones. But what you said today here in court was true about me. And I will pay for this for the rest of my life. Thank you. Sanchez is sentenced to 75 years to life. In prison, investigators question him about his compulsions. He indicated that his motive for committing these crimes was just some uncontrollable urge to do it. The guy asked him, you know, 12 years, you know, what happened, where were you? He just said, I learned to control it. It's just something I wanted to do, and I couldn't stop myself from doing it. You do a lot of things in 35 years of police work. You come across a lot of different people, but this man was just the worst. For others, like one of Sanchez's early rape victims, it's a chance to move on. I hope that people learn that you can still function every day and go about your life and know not to be scared and not to hide it, because if you hide and you don't tell people and you don't talk about it, it's just going to happen to somebody else. For the entire Buffalo community, Christine Mazur, daughter of May Jane Mazur, expresses her gratitude. It's kind of overwhelming, but it's really nice to thank them, to thank y'all for working so hard and helping me close yeah. well, the chapter. He was a dangerous guy, and he was out there for a long time. I'm glad he's in prison. He can't hurt anybody else or anybody else's family. The investigators ask Anthony if he was involved in the Delaware Park rapes. He said, I would never do that. I have sisters at home. I would never rape a woman. He wanted to cut the interview short because it was spaghetti night that day at Attic, and he didn't want to miss the spaghetti dinner. I remember when we, we walked out of the prison, all three of us looked at each other, and we said, no way is this our guy. And so that actually started um, another lead in the investigation, starting to take another look at those attacks that uh, Anthony Capozzi was um, um, arrested for. Detectives immediately dig into the old Delaware Park rape files, hoping for new clues to the bike path killer's identity. They make two case breakthroughs. First, a critical statement from a rape survivor. In one of those files, Scott found a mention, a note, that the Buffalo Police Department had received a complaint from the rape victim in 1981 that a couple days following her rape, her family trying to cheer her up, took her to a local shopping mall. Outside the mall, the rape victim came face to face with her attacker. He was with his wife, pushing a small child in a stroller. Immediately, they both recognized each other. They left in a hurry, but a relative of hers followed him uh, to his car, got the license plate number. 
location of the, the incidents, the words that he said to the victims, and other similarities struck us as, as, as being the same suspect that we were investigating. Detectives suddenly realize the bike path killer has committed even more rapes than they thought. And we're looking back and forth. Like, oh, this guy didn't do 10. He's done at least 16. They didn't start in 1985, they started in 1981. And even more terrifying, another man was arrested and charged with his early crimes. Detective Lelano was there and he goes, oh yeah, there was a guy that was arrested, he was a Delaware Park rapist. And that's when I said, yeah, that was Anthony Capozzi, I remember him. I said, well, where is he now? Because he just didn't do these attacks. He said, uh, he's in jail. He's in jail for these crimes. I said, well, we gotta find him because he didn't do those crimes then. In fact, Anthony Capozzi is in Attica prison, where he's been for 21 years. There was absolutely no physical evidence linking him to the crimes. He was convicted basically on uh, two eyewitness testimonies. That's it. We went to Attica Prison. We sat down with uh, Anthony Capozzi, and we started um, talking to him. And Anthony had victims, and other similarities struck us as, as, as being the same suspect that we were investigating. Detectives suddenly realize the bike path killer has committed even more rapes than they thought. And we're looking back and forth. Like, oh, this guy didn't do 10. He's done at least 16. They didn't start in 1985, they started in 1981. And even more terrifying, another man was arrested and charged with his early crimes. Detective Lelano was there, he goes, oh yeah, there was a guy that was arrested, he was a Delaware Park rapist, and that's when I said, yeah, that was Anthony Capozzi, I remember him. I said, well, where is he now? Because he just didn't do these attacks. He said, uh, he's in jail. He's in jail for these crimes. I said, well, we gotta find him because he didn't do those crimes then. In fact, Anthony Capozzi is in Attica prison, where he's been for 21 years. There was absolutely no physical evidence linking him to the crimes. He was convicted basically on uh, two eyewitness testimonies. That's it. We went to Attica Prison. We sat down with uh, Anthony Capozzi, and we started um, talking to him. And Anthony has um, some decreased uh, mental capacity. We had to find him because he didn't do those crimes then. In fact, Anthony Capozzi is in Attica Prison, where he's been for 21 years. There was absolutely no physical evidence linking him to the crimes. He was convicted basically on uh, two eyewitness testimonies. That's it. We went to Attica Prison. We sat down with uh, Anthony Capozzi, and we started um, talking to him. And Anthony has um, some decreased uh, mental capacity. The investigators ask Anthony if he was involved in the Delaware Park rapes. He said, I would never do that. I have sisters at home. I would never rape a woman. He wanted to cut the interview short because it was spaghetti night that day at Attic and he didn't want to miss the spaghetti dinner. I remember when we, we walked out of the prison, all three of us looked at each other and we said, no way is this our guy. And so that actually started um, another lead in the investigation, starting to take another look at those attacks that uh, Anthony Capozzi was um, um, arrested for. Detectives immediately dig into the old Delaware Park rape files, hoping for new clues to the bike path killer's identity. They make two case breakthroughs. First, a critical statement from a rape survivor. In one of those files, a couple miles away, the vehicle is locked and the keys are missing. There is no sign of Joan or her belongings. The Erie County Sheriff's Office immediately launches a search. They start in the parking lot next to the bike path where Joan's car was first spotted. We're talking about an area along the bike path that's probably six or seven miles long. 
stretching out, you know, a, a couple hundred yards from the path itself. It was an enormous area. Authorities contact Joan's family for any information on her whereabouts. My mother called me on a Friday and said that the police said that Joan Lee was missing. We don't know what's happened to her, but we know something's happened because she didn't pick up her little boy at preschool. I was just so surprised. I mean, I just thought, well, sir, certainly there's a, you know, a logical explanation for her not being there. My older sister called me and asked if I'd heard anything about uh, Joan. And I said, no, what do you mean? And she says, well, she's missing. And, you know, have you heard anything? Or she called or anything like that? And I said, no, uh, I haven't heard. And, um, and uh, you know, I didn't know what to think about that exactly. The next afternoon, the sheriff's office decides to scale back the search and move on to other leads. But Joan's husband is certain his wife is still out there. On the 16th anniversary of Linda Yalem's murder, police raced to a suburban Buffalo bike path where 45-year-old jogger Joan Diver was last seen. Joan Diver, she just dropped her children off at daycare. She was going to do what her ritual was, head out to the Clarence bike path, get a five-mile run in, come back and pick her child up from daycare shortly after 11 a.m. When she failed to pick her children up at daycare, the daycare center contacted her husband, who's a professor at the University of Buffalo, and her husband called 911 to report it, his wife uh, missing. Mr. Diver called and indicated that he was concerned that uh, something had to happen to his wife because there would be no way that she wouldn't have picked up the child at the school. And he left work at the University of Buffalo to drive to pick up the kids. On his way home, Stephen Diver notices his wife's SUV in the bike path parking lot. He calls 911, but when police arrive minutes later, the SUV is gone. Someone move her car. That was the question we had before us now. Then, less than an hour later, patrol officers locate the vehicle. Joan Diver's... It felt like a wire. The victims were attacked pretty much the same way. There was a grot used, which is kind of a rope or a wire type device that was used to gain their compliance. It's completely terrifying because you have absolutely no power or control of what's happening. You can't breathe, so you can't think clearly of what to do. He would carefully plan locations, not victims. There really was never a victim type, but there were distinct locations. And you just wait. Whoever it happened by next was a person he selected. Once he got me to the place where he wanted me, he instantly tied my hands up behind my back, so I was laying on my hands. So I couldn't move, I couldn't go anywhere. Composite sketches based on the victim's descriptions are strikingly similar. I saw he had olive skin, like Puerto Rican or Spanish. Some of them had him as Italian or Hispanic with a possible Spanish accent. They had him with dark hair. But there's one thing all the victims said. He had piercing eyes. He had these eyes they would never forget. Deep, dark eyes that they would never forget. Every single person, we said hello, yeah, we're with the Erie County Sheriff's Office. He said, I know why you're looking for me. It's about that thing that happened many years ago. I wasn't driving the vehicle. My nephew, Altimio Sanchez, was driving the vehicle. It's the moment detectives have been waiting for. They now have eyewitnesses that tie Sanchez to two of the crimes. After 20 years, the pieces of the puzzle are finally falling into place. Immediately, I made phone calls and got everybody back to the office that Wednesday. The whole task force at 3 o'clock for a meeting. At the meeting, the task force members review the new evidence. Sanchez was absent from work and seen on the bike path the day Linda Yellow was murdered. His uncle admits Sanchez was driving his car when it was spotted at the mall. 
and Sanchez fits the description of the killer. I could tell you every person in that room, all 12, instantly came up with the same thought. Holy cow, we gotta get surveillance on this guy. Detectives need to obtain DNA from Sanchez to prove their case, and there's no time to waste. Can you imagine if we have him as a suspect, and while we have him, he either flees, or God help us, he victimizes another woman. Get more solved online. On the 16th anniversary of Linda Yalem's murder, police raced to a suburban Buffalo bike path where 45-year-old jogger Joan Diver was last seen. Joan Diver. She had just dropped her children off at daycare. She was going to do what her ritual was, head out to the Clarence bike path, get a five-mile run in, come back and pick her child up from daycare shortly after 11 a.m. When she failed to pick her children up at daycare, the daycare center contacted her husband, who's a professor at the University of Buffalo, and her husband called 911 to report it, his wife uh, missing. Mr. Diver called and indicated that he was concerned that uh, something had to happen to his wife because there would be no way that she wouldn't have picked up the child at the school. And he left work at the University of Buffalo to drive to pick up the kids. On his way home, Stephen Diver notices his wife's SUV in the bike path parking lot. He calls 911, but when police arrive minutes later, the SUV is gone. Someone move her car. I was just so surprised. I mean, I just thought, well, sir, certainly there's a, you know, a logical explanation for her not being there. My older sister called me and asked if I'd heard anything about uh, Joan. And I said, no, what do you mean? And she says, well, she's missing. And, you know, have you heard anything? Or she called or anything like that? And I said, no, uh, I haven't heard. And. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't know what to think about that exactly. The next afternoon, the sheriff's office decides to scale back the search and move on to other leads. But Joan's husband is certain his wife is still out there. With the help of friends and neighbors, he continues the hunt. Two days later, his fears are confirmed. A volunteer discovers Joan's body. 15, 20 yards off the bike path in this real thick brush, and she was uh, found basically laying, uh, laying in that brush. One of the things that jumped out immediately was that double ligature mark around her neck. It's now the familiar signature of a deadly predator. It was like all the other crime scenes. It was off a bike path. Joan Diver was left in a clearing near a wooded area. She had double ligature. It appeared that there had been a struggle, but there was no DNA found on her body, and the medical examiner, the interview short because it was spaghetti night that day at Attic, and he didn't want to miss the spaghetti dinner. I remember when we, we walked out of the prison, all three of us looked at each other and we said, no way is this our guy. And so that actually started um, another lead in the investigation, starting to take another look at those attacks that uh, Anthony Capozzi was um, um, arrested for. Detectives immediately dig into the old Delaware Park rape files, hoping for new clues to the bike path killer's identity. They make two case breakthroughs. First, a critical statement from a rape survivor. In one of those files, Scott found a mention, a note, that the Buffalo Police Department had received a complaint from the rape victim in 1981 that a couple days following her rape, her family trying to cheer her up, took her to a local shopping mall. Outside the mall, the rape victim came face to face with her attacker. He was with his wife, pushing a small child in a stroller. Immediately, they both recognized each other. They left in a hurry, but a relative of hers followed him uh, to his car, got the license plate number. Police ran the plates, 
the vehicle belonged to a man named Wilfredo Carabello. Buffalo police, when they went to interview Wilfredo Carabello, ligature mark around her neck. It's now the familiar signature of a deadly predator. It was like all the other crime scenes. It was off a bike path. Joan Diver was left in a clearing near a wooded area. She had double ligature. It appeared that there had been a struggle, but there was no DNA found on her body, and the medical examiner, uh, his, his finding was that there had not been a sexual assault. Detectives quickly focus on Joan's SUV. Whoever moved it may have left clues. We were pretty sure that someone involved in the crime had moved the vehicle. So in a process like that, you're going to go over every inch of the vehicle, front to back, interior, exterior, and uh, basically like, leave no stone unturned. Deputy Maruso starts with the car's interior. You would think of the necessary places that someone have to touch the vehicle to move it. We thought that the steering wheel had been swapped down. We necessarily swapped the gear shift knob. We swapped the buttons on the radio, and then came to the point where we said, we should swap this ignition. It was a, quite a large shroud. The key fits inside the shroud, and uh, we just swabbed the exterior of that. The swabs are sent to the lab for DNA testing. One of the items, the ignition switch, yielded a pr